What up, everybody? Welcome to another That's OD. It's your boy, Ohm. I'm here with my dude, Dave, where we talk all things L.A. basketball. So we always start with as the Lakers turn, uh, Dave. Well, first of all, wait, I got to say happy, th- happy belated Thanksgiving to everybody. We did not have a show last week. Uh, we were off for the holidays. I hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving. I know I did. I know Dave probably had a great Thanksgiving. We always start with as the Lakers turn, Dave. Dare I say maybe they they starting to get things going here, Dave. Uh, I know it's been, a, we took a week off, but it looks like the Lakers are starting to play better. Uh, they've won six of eight, I believe, right, Dave? And now we're in December 1st. This is the month that I think a lot of Laker fans have been waiting for. Because we're about 15 days away from when guys can start to be traded, guys that were signed this summer can finally be dealt. Dave, what do you think of how the Lakers are playing? Have they turned a corner here a little bit? I know they have a treacherous stretch. And what are you hearing behind the scenes uh, as we're about a little over two weeks away from maybe when the Lakers could potentially make a move? Well, let's start with how they're playing. Yes, they have taken care of business against teams that they should be. San Antonio Spurs three times, a team that is clearly tanking right now. One of those wins, they had uh, Pirtle playing well and Sochan playing well, and all of a sudden both those guys came down with uh, in-game <laughs> injuries and had to be benched to help the Spurs get that. Come on, Pop, come seeking. on. Yeah, exactly. You know, they beat the uh, Brooklyn Nets without Kyrie, without Ben Simmons. They just beat the Portland Trailblazers without Damian Lillard, without Josh Hart, and playing the Blazers on the second night of a back-to-back when the Blazers had to fly from Portland to L.A. That said, though, winning six out of eight has certainly energized this group, and as they look ahead to this upcoming road trip that will send them all over the East Coast, you got the Milwaukee Bucks, Toronto Raptors, the Sixers, the Pistons, the Wizards, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they feel like they can continue this momentum, even though the components are getting tougher. And of course it's leading into that December 15th date, as you mentioned, Oh, I reported earlier this week that that is the date that the Lakers are circling where they believe more teams will engage with them about potential trades, looking to get those two draft picks they have in 27 and 29. Also talking to people around the Lakers organization over the last week or so, I am convinced that the Lakers will make a trade or trades to improve this team. I think the figuring out period, prove it to us period has been passed. Uh, They have proven it. They've seen Anthony Davis playing at this bubble level. They've seen LeBron James's commitment on the court and off the court becoming more and more vocal in the time he was out with a groin injury. And they've also seen the way some of these younger pieces have started to fit around those stars that it, it is worth it to trade. You know, they'd prefer to only trade one of those two picks, but certainly it's worth it to trade some of the current salary that they have, attach a pick or two picks to it, and get this team better. I certainly anticipate uh, you know, by mid-January, uh, if not sooner, we're talking about uh, an imminent trade. So uh, we're not talking about like a blockbuster trade, obviously. I mean, even if they were to trade their two first round picks, I know the Lakers in their mind would want to give up two first round picks for a blockbuster kind of deal. But are we talking like, uh, you know, would this be like a B level type of trade? Let, let's say if like if Turner healed, uh, Miles Turner, buddy healed. These, these are two names that have been mentioned with the Lakers forever now, the last several months. Would that be like a B-level type of trade in your mind, Dave? Like, is that the type of trade you you think they could make? Or would it be maybe even something, you know, a little lower than that? I mean, it could be lower. Certainly, they could, rather than going for the Russell Westbrook and, and trying to take on $40 million in salary, maybe you pair Patrick Beverly with the Kendrick Nunn. You have about $20 million in salary there. And then you go after a, a single piece. And maybe that only requires a single uh, trade uh, draft pick in the trade. Now, uh, one thing you have to consider is that, you know, this is the measuring that they're trying to do. Is it better to trade for a guy like Turner, who they would then extend rather than have him leave as, you know, an asset that walks out the door after only playing as a rental for a few months? Or is it better going up this smaller deal, maintaining cap space in order to pursue some guys this summer when Russell Westbrook comes off the book, regardless, you know, some guys, let's just say Kyrie Irving from the Brooklyn Nets, 
Uh, that could be a type of guy that they could be able to sign outright without attaching a pick to it. Uh, so there is a scenario where you go after a smaller type of deal. And listen to the, we know the teams. We've been talking about these teams since the summertime that they potentially deal with. We're talking about teams like Charlotte like the San Antonio Spurs, like the Utah Jazz, like the Indiana Pacers, like Chicago Bulls. Like those are the, the, the group that I anticipate uh, the phone calls being made to most frequently coming up. And if you get the smaller type of deal, uh, Russell comes off the books this summer, you maintain that other first round pick and they potentially you sign Kyrie Irving, pair him obviously with your two stars and LeBron and AD and still have these youthful pieces growing around them, you know, it, it, it kind of is a way to accomplish the two things I've been trying to do all year, which is stay competitive in the moment while also have some flexibility moving forward. That wouldn't be the worst case scenario for the Lakers, but you know, again, come December 15th, they're hoping teams start calling them being like, okay, we're ready to deal now because those, those deals we signed in the summertime we can trade them. And, oh, by the way, one of those contracts is Patrick Beverly. The Lakers can trade Patrick Beverly come December 15th. I know you got to be realistic, Dave, but that's just, it's not sexy. It's boring. I want them to make a big move. Like, I'm actually wondering, okay, let, let's say, uh, I know AD wants to go four and two. This is the goal on this this with this upcoming road trip. But what if, they, what if it's like disastrous? What if it's like, I don't know, you know, they win one game or maybe two. Does that actually turn up and ramp up the heat more on the Lakers and Rob Palenka to make a move? And B, is one move of that, that caliber that you were talking about, is that enough to really make the Lakers that much better? What do you think? I, I reported uh, this week that the, the leaders in the Lakers locker room, uh, they believe that they are a couple of players away from being a true contender. And certainly the longer you wait and the more you struggle – Whenever that deal gets made, it's going to require to expend a lot of energy to shoot back up the standings. And then, then you kind of leave some stuff up for chance because when you're in constant chase mode, it puts more stress on everybody. Maybe an injury happens and you have less margin for error, of course. But you know, look at the West standings right now. There's no world beater. I mean, the Phoenix Suns are looking like the strong team they've been over the last couple of years. Um, you know, and Denver is starting to look like the team that made the Western Conference Finals a couple of years ago with that smatted shooting. But you look at the rest of the guys there. Uh, there's no one really separating themselves from the pack. So even if the Lakers have a poor road trip, which I actually don't think they will, I, I think they're going to end up, you know, probably worst case scenario, three and three. Uh, so they're not going to be losing a ton of ground here. Uh, even if the Lakers ha have a mediocre or poor road trip, they're not falling out of the picture anytime soon because the West is so uh, mediocre. Let me give you the uh, updated standings as of Thursday morning. Cause I looked at this just yesterday uh, entering last night's games. I think only two games had separated the top four in the West. Now it's three separating the top five, but really, I mean, like for one through 10, the 10th team, the Portland trailblazers, are four and a half out of first place. Um, and then your Lakers, uh, not your Lakers, Dave, but your <laughs> Lakers, everybody, okay, uh, is six and a half out of first, despite being eight and 12. And eight and 12 certainly looks a lot better than what they were, you know, just about two weeks ago. Um, six and a half. So th they're really only two games out of the play-in. And they're only, unbelievably, three games out of like sixth place where the Sacramento Kings are. So the, the West is just absolutely crowded. And I, I don't see it really going to be a lot of separation for a minute because you've got teams like New Orleans Pelicans. They're, th they're, they're currently in third. They're dealing with injuries. Memphis Grizzlies in fourth. They're dealing with injuries. Clippers in fifth. They're dealing with injuries. So a lot of these teams, they, they, I don't think there's going to be a lot of separation. Maybe the Utah Jazz. Maybe, the, you know, they got to figure out what they're going to do. They're 13-11. They got to figure out, are, are we tanking? <laughs> or are we actually going to try to make the playoffs? I'm sure maybe Danny Ainge may actually take that decision out of their hands eventually with a couple moves uh, after December 15th. So it'll be really interesting to see what how these standings go. So let, let's turn to the Clippers, Dave. Um, yeah. I, it's, it's like a broken record. We keep talking about it. Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, they've been out. Um, and so the, the Clippers are dealing with a lot of injuries. Luke Kennard has been out. 
Norm Powell is now out. He had this sensational game at Portland. Man, was he good in that fourth quarter. Wow. Yeah, he was really starting to cook. Um, really, you know, really getting his game going, looking like the guy who could be the third star for this team. And then, of course, he strains his groin a little bit. And so, you know, you know how groin strains are. Those things can take a long time just because you just don't want them to flare up again. You really want to get rid of it. It's like a hamstring almost. So um, the, the Clippers, where, where are we at now? They, they play Saturday, Dave. This will be the first chance that we could potentially see Paul George or Kawhi Leonard or even Luke Kennard return. Um, their status have, have not been determined yet. What I have been hearing is that Kawhi is getting closer. Um, last Sunday, the Clippers had ruled out Paul George and Luke Kennard uh, immediately for their two-game road trip, which they just did in Portland and Utah, but Kawhi's status was to be determined as far as whether or not he would even travel with the team. That's a that's a sign of optimism there, uh, a, a positive sign for him that he was getting closer. Now, I think on Monday afternoon, they declared him out and he did not travel with the team. But it, you know, it looks like he's getting closer with that ankle sprain. They they need him back. They they gotta start getting going here because the schedule is brutal for them. They they I think I've been saying this um, ever since the creation of the show. <laughs> <laughs> they, they play 61 games before All-Star break, which is absolutely insane. 21 on the way back. Um, this month is jam-packed with games, which I'll get into a little bit later. But poor Ty Lue. I mean, you can see how frustrated he is. Number one, he's got to answer questions all the time about when are these guys coming back? What's the latest on this guy? You know, how long is it going to take? Is this guy going to practice? Because he's the one, you know, most taking you be, taking most of these fans behind the scenes. We don't get the general manager every day to talk about the status of injuries and things like that. We may be able to talk to them in the hallway or things like that, but they don't do press conferences. Uh, most general managers do press conferences maybe twice a year, a season, at the beginning of the season, maybe at the trade deadline if they made a move or something like that, and then maybe a third time at the end of the season. Uh, so really, it's the head coach that always has to be the face of the organization who has to answer questions about whatever it may be. Like Doc Rivers used to be great at that when there was controversy uh, you know, with the, with the owner and things like that, or previous to Steve Ballmer, uh, Donald Sterling. You know, anything like that, the coach is always the front-facing guy. So Ty Lue is the guy that always has to give the injury updates. Poor Ty Lue. But, uh, you know, really, he's, he, the one thing I would say is he said this to LA Times reporter Andrew Greif on this road trip. He was asked, um, how come you don't maybe change the offense a little bit? Because if you don't have Kawhi, this offense is predicated yeah. around Kawhi and Paul George, and they're not in there, and they haven't been in there now for almost two weeks. Uh, do you think about changing the offense? And he said, no, because I think our injured guys are getting close to coming back. So that is a positive sign for the Clippers. There's also no practice time in today's no. NBA. It's talking about 61 games before the all-star break. Where would there be the practice time to implement a new offense? And Andrew Gret does a great job. I'm not coming at him, but just yeah. think about the practicality of what it is. It makes sense to see what you got and await those guys coming back. Because guess what? If they don't come back and you it doesn't matter what offense you run anyway. <laughs> You're yeah. not going anywhere. No, I mean, I, I asked Ty this last week at Golden State. I said, last year you had success simplifying the offense when you knew Paul George was going to be out for three months. And yeah. I'm not saying you know Paul George and Kawhi Leonard are going to be out for three months. But have you thought about simplifying the offense? And he was like, no, because, uh, you know, it's not going to be long-term injuries. Um, and it. he's like, and I want to continue them to build these good habits and understand this offense. He's just like, oh, we're not there yet. So that, that's a good sign for the Clippers. Um, and credit Ty Lu, He is amazing at getting the most out of little he have. I mean, they were down double digits in Portland. That game should have been over. They stole it in Portland. Poor Chauncey Billups. I think they actually said, the Blazers actually said they were demoralized as the Clippers were coming back. You got the Blazers last night in, uh, you know, against the Lakers. Um, so I, I think it was a hard time for them to recover from that loss. They, uh, the Clippers lost a tough one in Utah. They, and they're just under man. I mean, no Norm Powell, no Kawhi Leonard, no Luke Kennard, no Paul George. Eventually it's going to catch up to, with them. But hopefully, hopefully, I don't know, they start to get some of these bodies back. We'll see. Uh, Dave, we're at the second part of the show, our segment, LA Confidential, where we unload our LA notebooks. Dave, what do you got for me for your LA Confidential this week? Oh, my sat down with Lonnie Walker, the fourth ahead of his return game to San Antonio. We talked about a variety of things, but, you know, really interesting to me that he starts every day with 20 minutes of meditation uh, by his bed. He sits against 
the wall and tells himself the mantra, dominate the day, dominate the day, dominate the day, breathing in, breathing out, which for a 23 year old, like, I'm like, wow, I, you know, I, I'm watching sports center when I wake up <laughs> when I'm 23 yeah. years old, I'm, I'm, you know, whatever. Uh, eating the, Bo- a bowl the, of Buddhist, the Buddhist in me likes it, Dave. Right. The Buddhist in me likes yeah, it. Absolutely. I, I was super impressed, but part of our conversation beyond the meditation was just his on court play. Um, as of last week, he was, third on the team for the Lakers and dunks behind only Anthony Davis and LeBron James. And there have been some that have been quite remarkable. I mean, like there's been some highlight real worthy stuff. And so I asked him, you know, we've seen uh, the Laker platform lead to guys, you know, Shannon uh, Brown in the dunk contest, Dwight Howard in the dunk contest. Go go Michigan State, Shannon Brown. That's right. Could we see you in the dunk contest? And Lonnie told me, if he continues to dunk at this rate, continues to you know, keep up with this notoriety, he will throw his hat in the ring. So uh, as we start to piece together who we can see in this year's dunk contest, hopefully we get guys like John Moran or Shaden Sharp for the Blazers. Oh. I think Lonnie Walker would be a pretty good addition for that group. Uh, Dave, rate Shaden Sharp's dunk the, last night against the Lakers where it looked like he... <laughs> I mean, it's one thing for a guy to get a running start and grab that in the air and dunk it. I mean, he looked like he just propelled himself off a pogo stick. It reminded me of like young Blake Griffin, uh, you know, back in Oklahoma where he would hit his head on the rim. Like that was the type of elevation you're seeing out of that guy. He is incredible. Actually, I really like this Portland team because we saw them without Josh Hart and without Dame Lillard and without Nasir Little. They got a lot of athletic switchable pieces and, and they can shoot a bit and, and like smart toughness i think they're gonna be all right they're actually they're already playing a lot better than i thought they would and jeremy grant syracuse guy taking care of business uh as the, the lead guy right now uh i think chauncey learned a little bit from his time with the clippers i think he saw how that team was built um you know interchangeable pieces a lot of guys who can defend two-way guys um i love chauncey he brings a, he brings toughness to him jeremy grant is having an unbelievable season. I, I think Damian Lillard talked about this the other night on the telecast against the Clippers that he, he knew Jeremy Grant, what Jeremy Grant was capable of offensively because he saw it on Team USA. Um, and, you know, hopefully Dame is getting closer. Portland, look, I, I think the Lakers and Clippers are, both have to watch out for Portland. I don't, I don't think they're going away. So what's in your notebook, LA Confidential? What do you got for um, us? John Wall last night uh, played and and had one of his better games, obviously with those guys out, but you know, he is behind the scenes and he said this publicly as well. I think he's frustrated with how he's being used. Um, I don't know. He's not like making a, creating a stink about it by any means or anything like that. But I think John Wall would like to play more minutes right now. His minutes cap is at about 26. He played, I think 25 last night. He's still not playing uh, in both games of back-to-backs. He's still sitting at one. I asked him in Golden State, uh, when, you know, when is that gonna? When is that restriction coming off? And he just said, looked at me with a frustrated look, and he said, I don't know. Uh, he obviously saying I'm gonna go with whatever the Clippers tell me to do and the medical staff, but he's saying this is something that's new to him. He's never had to play in like these little six-minute bursts. And when he's playing on the court, especially against last last night in Utah. Looks like he's literally trying to make the most of his six minute stretches. I mean, like he's trying to pack it in, Dave. Every single time he gets the ball, he is trying to sprint down court. If he sees two or three guys in front of him and no other Clippers, he's just going straight for the rim and attacking. And I would say about like 75% of the time, he's either drawing the foul or he's actually getting to the rim and trying to score and create something. So, and then there's a, you know, there's been some frustrating turnovers. Um, I think even he would he, he would admit that. Um, but like I think John Wall's trying to make the most of the situation. And and look, he, he goes back to Washington next week, which should be very interesting to see him. I know it'll be emotional for him. He's been back to DC uh since being traded, but that was I think in COVID when there were no fans. So this will be a chance for him uh to finally kind of get his due. I'm sure we'll talk more about that next week. But I think with John Wall, it'd be nice to see, you know, eventually him get a little more minutes and, and maybe getting these back-to-back games. I, I know the Clippers can use them. I think they're just being smart about it, kind of keeping their eye forward for the playoffs and making sure that John Wall is going to be healthy because, you know, he's only played in like 40 games in like the last three years. So, But you know um, what it sounds like to me, Ohm, this is his first taste of being a role player. Which, yes. you know, whether that is the Clippers' intention or not, obviously it sounds like it's, it's to protect his health. But 
this will be an adjustment that will probably be, be necessary for that team's ultimate success. Like John Wall has to recognize that he is a role player and the pecking order is Kawhi, Paul George, and he falls somewhere below that. Yeah, I mean, as he told me, like, I think early in the summer when I sat down with him, uh, the one thing that he liked about coming to the Clippers is that he did not have to be Batman every night. Uh, but actually, I think he, they could have used him as yeah. Batman last night in Utah because of all the injuries. But he's just not getting those type of minutes yet. Um, and I think he's trying to make the most out of it and and learn his, and learn his way with a new team. So um, let's get to uh, our favorite segment of the day <laughs> of, the, of the show. Uh where we say either you're a Hollywood star where, you know, you're playing well, you're trending up and maybe one day you'll put your, your hands in the cement and have your own Hollywood star. Or if it's a LA car chase where we're watching from 15,000 feet above in a helicopter and we're watching, you know, some crazy car chase develop where it's only going to end badly. Uh, Dave, who is your uh, Hollywood star uh, this week? I think this is the first time I've given this distinction to LeBron James this season, but I gotta go with LeBron. Uh, first 10 games of the season, he makes 17 threes total, uh, shoots in the 20s. The Lakers weren't winning. He didn't look as effective, not nearly as effective as it was last year. The four games since he's been back from a groin injury, 17 threes, shooting 50% from three in those games and the Lakers obviously have been racking up wins. You know, he was rough down the stretch. LeBron was two for eight in the fourth quarter against the Pacers when the Pacers had that 17 point comeback. So you got to mention that, but overall, as Darvin Ham said, LeBron James is trending in the right direction and you just see a certain pop uh, to his game right now. He's moving with a ton of freedom uh, and just his overall engagement level, the way he's carrying himself. He looks like somebody with 10 toes down that's invested in this group. So uh, if you get that version of LeBron James, there's reason for optimism. And what about you? What do you got for your star? So Dave, so LeBron's not taking those threes from the logo anymore, or just, just like two nah. steps past the logo. Exactly. <laughs> My Hollywood star, I'm going to call him Shaq Zoo. Dave, I don't know if you <laughs> saw Ivica Zubats earlier this week went absolutely ballistic and detonated on the Indiana Pacers 31 points, 29 rebounds, three blocks. He shot 14 of 17. Not only could he have been, was he in line for the to have a 30 and 30 game and be the first in Clippers history to do that as far as big men, uh, but he would have been the first to have 30 and 30 since Kareem Abdul-Jabbar for several decades, which is absolutely insane. I got to read the statistic to you from our great people at ESPN Stats and Info. Ivica Zubac is the sixth player to record 30 points, 25 rebounds, and 80% shooting in a game ever. He joins five Hall of Famers, Wilt Chamberlain, Shaquille O'Neal, Charles Barkley, Satch Sanders, and Bob Pettit. And Wilt did this 10 times. It just lets you know how good Wilt was. But Ivica Zubac has been putting together quite a season. And, you know, he fouled out in that game. That's why he did not get to 30 and 30. It's really funny, you know, no matter how good he beats the Zubats does, when we ask Ty Lue about it, it's kind of become this running joke. Like Ty Lue actually will always find something to humble he beats the Zubats. You know, like if, if, if he has like, you know, 20 rebounds, he'll be like, man, Zoo was great on the boards. And he'll be like, yeah, but the rebound Zoo didn't grab, you know, turn into <laughs> offensive rebounds for somebody else. It's like, Zoo, it's like Ty Lue always finds something you know, just a little bit off on Zoo's game, which is so funny. And I, I remember I've, I've actually said this to Zoo. I'm like, man, you can't do anything great. He's like, that's okay. He's like, uh, you know, guys get me all the time. If I got to be that guy that everybody says, oh, you didn't do this, you did that, I'll take it. But I got to tell you, he's having a season that is, you know, he might have a candidacy for most improved. I know a lot of people are like, ah, no, no, no. But if you look at his numbers, he has been terrific. Now, the only thing is the last couple of nights, it's amazing. Dude almost has 30 and 30 day. <laughs> the last two games in the fourth quarter, he's actually not really played that much because Ty Lue has gone with a smaller lineup and he's actually used um, a G League guy, second round rookie, Musa Diabate, who was terrific. He's brought a lot of energy. Um, he brings a lot of enthusiasm, but this guy almost had 30 and 30 and he's still struggling to kind of finish games. Ty likes those small lineups. Uh, but I think Ty Lue is seeing, if he's a Zubas is showing him, look, if you're going to have guys injured, 
you can come into me and go into me. And so if this, if there's a matchup in the playoffs where they're going to face a big man like Nikola Jokic or something like that, you know, perhaps Zoo is showing them that he can get the ball. You can give them the ball inside and he can score and he can do something. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's more than a few people within the Lakers organization that just shake their head. <laughs> well, every quick, time, another, every another, time they see a box line like that from the Zoo box. Uh, one quick story on that. Zoo told us um, the day he was traded, Magic called him and said, yeah, you know, um, we, we just want to tell you, and this is, be- I think this is before the news is broken. He said, he said something, Woj hadn't broken. It was just moments for Woj to break it. And he said, you know, oh, uh, Magic calls. And he's like, uh, yeah, Zoo, we, we traded you. And he's like, where? And he goes, the Clippers. And he goes, oh, okay. He was thinking, no, that's good. I don't have to go that far. And he goes, he goes, for who? <laughs> and then when they told him, Zoo was like shocked. You know what I mean? Because I think, I guess, you know, any player, when they hear that when I'm traded, they want to know who they were traded for and hopefully know that, you know, okay, this is what I was worth. <laughs> yeah. So that I think Zoo was just as shocked as every Laker fan out there uh, of who he was traded for, Mike Pascala. And remember, I th- and then he even said, you know, Beasley was also included in that trade as well because the Clippers, I mean, the Lakers were not only trying to clear roster space, but also they were hoping they would get a big man who would spread the floor. That did not turn out well uh, for the Lakers. So my uh, LA car chase, Dave, is the Clippers schedule, as I talked about earlier in the day. Uh, I don't know. You know, I really don't know what the schedule makers were thinking. This season has been ridiculous. They've been packing in so many games. It's as if like, you know, this is an abbreviated schedule. Okay. We have a rare two day break right now. Clippers coming off of back to back. So they're off today. They have a rare practice, I think maybe tomorrow. And then they play Saturday. This is only the third two day break they've had since the season started, I believe they don't have another one until like the third week of December. Dave, they also have three times this month, four games in six days, three times in December. I mean, it's insane. The only, the only like kind of like decent week they have is the week of Christmas, I believe. So the Clippers schedule has been absolutely insane. And, and you ask, you know, you're right. There aren't that many practice days. And you're wondering, like, when you're trying to figure out when an injured player comes back, usually the progression is, okay, we got to want to get him back into practice first and run him through a practice and then we can bring him back and feel good about it. No, I mean, instead they've had to have like, you know, Kawhi Leonard do individual workouts and then like, you know, they'll they'll get five guys to come to the facility. It might not even be five players. It may be like three players and a couple staff members or something like that to really get Kawhi, you know, some five on five work or things like that. Um, so, you know, it, it's getting tougher for teams to navigate this of course, the weird thing for the Clippers, though, is they're going to have, I would say, almost too much practice time after All-Star break because they only have 21 games. So uh, we'll see how this schedule goes for them because they got two big road trips. I don't know what's going on in crypto in December, Dave. Why are both teams on the yeah, road? Right? Do you have any idea? I mean, it's like... This isn't, you know, this isn't Grammys time of year, right? No, no. I think the Grammys yeah. is usually like in, in, the, in January or February, but... Uh, and I think the American Music Awards were already, already happened. So something must be going on in crypto. But what is your L.A. car chase, Dave? Yeah, car chase. I'm going to just look at some of these Lakers injuries, right? They've been waiting and waiting and waiting to be a full unit this year. Darvin M in game 20 has to go with starting lineup number 12 because he hasn't had all his guys available. They thought this Portland game would be a great opportunity to be fully whole. Troy Brown Jr. has a workout in the morning, an individual workout. Darvin Ham likes to say, get his vitamins in, you know, getting up some shots. He tweaks his left foot. Then about 30 minutes before tip-off, late, late scratch, Lonnie Walker, the fourth, is also ruled out with a sore left foot. And this is just kind of uh, emblematic of the Lakers season thus far, that they haven't been able to get everything moving in the right things. direction. Right. We can't we have, have nice, nice things, things in LA, Dave. We can't have nice things in LA these days. Right. <laughs> oh, I mean, I, I have seen Lonnie in the preseason walk around in some Ugg slippers. Apparently, LeBron James gave the entire team a pair of them as gifts. Um, I, maybe he's going to be, you know, rocking them on this road trip to get that. You know, those are pretty comfy. Get that, that foot uh, back in order. But you know, it'd be nice at some point soon to see the fully functioning Los Angeles Lakers with the roster that they envisioned in the off season, just to see, you know, like I said before, they're going to make a trade. 
but just to see how major of a trade that they really have to do if they have everyone available to them. Because guess what? Some of their guys, which is nice to see, we, we haven't been able to say about the Lakers over the last couple of years, some of their guys are getting better in season. Austin Reeves is getting better yeah. in season. Max Christie getting better in season. Uh, I would throw Lonnie Walker in that mix and Troy Brown Jr. in that mix. But if they're not healthy, they can't get better. Yeah, we even forgot to mention Matt Ryan, uh, the little move they made. Um, Dave, that move was kind of made for, you know, December 15th, potentially, right? Yeah, absolutely. Matt Ryan, shout out to Matt Ryan. You know, comes into the Lakers, nothing guaranteed whatsoever. He kills it in a, a group workout in the offseason. He continues to kill it when he gets his opportunity in preseason, hits six threes against the defending champion Golden State Warriors in San Francisco. Uh, earns a you know partially guaranteed deal, makes the opening day roster, saves their butts with a last second three against the Orleans Pelicans at a time when I think the Lakers were one and six and they really needed to get something going in, in their direction. Um, you know, it's part of the business. Uh, I, I, the tough part, man, I had a great chat with Matt Ryan pregame last night. Uh, he's oh. from like the White Plains, New, New York area, which is close to Philly. He, he had plans to see family when, when the team was in Philly. He was looking forward to a 10-day per diem, uh, you know, thick envelope he was going to get uh, when he got on the plane for the long uh, plane ride. So, obviously, uh, I'm sure the news uh, took him by surprise. But that is an indicator uh, that the Lakers will be making a move to give themselves some roster flexibility if they had to take on, say, a deal where they get back three players and, and only send out two. They have that extra roster spot open to do so. Uh, but, but Matt Ryan should hold his head high, man. Like that, he made the most of his opportunity with the Lakers and, and you know, hopefully he did enough to get the eye of another team out there. You know, uh, the Boston Celtics, he only played five minutes with them. Uh, with the Lakers, he hits a, a big time shot to send a game to overtime. Hopefully his next stop in the NBA, um, he's part of the legitimate rotation. But I think that does it for us. You got anything else though? Nope. Take us out, Dave. For Ohm Young Masuk, I'm David Grimetterman. Treat the game well, and it'll treat you well. See you next week on That's OD. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.